Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Construction Record Podcast. I'm digital media editor Warren Fry for our annual spooky Halloween special. And with me, I have... Uh, Vince Versace, director of news media, daily commercial news and journal of commerce here at Construct Connect. And joining us is an old friend that we've had in these conversations quite a few times. And some of our longtime readers have read some of his uh, great work. Yeah, Peter Kenner. I am a longtime writer for daily commercial news and very proud of it. Uh, and uh, never fear uh, longtime fans of the Halloween special, uh, or fear, because it's a Halloween special. But uh, we will talk about old movies and shoehorn that in, don't worry. But first, we're talking to Peter about his latest uh, articles, which are all about ghost towns. So maybe take it away and tell us about some ghost town lore, as it involves construction, peripherally probably. Well, of course it does. Um, I, I was interviewing the man who owns the town of Kitzel. His name is Krish. Suthan Theron, and uh, he's a U.S. investor. The town of Kitzel, actually in B.C., mm-hmm. uh, it closed entirely when the molybdenum mine that was operating there uh, it shut down. It was unable to reopen, and so 40 years ago, pretty much everybody left it. But it's an unusual ghost town in that people always had hopes of bringing it back. And so instead of letting it fall into ruin, uh, the people who owned it for various periods of time kind of maintained it or maintained many of the houses, which belonged to the company that was trying to get people to stay in that town. And there's no real road access to it. It's two hours from the nearest community by any reasonable stretch of the imagination. So uh, Chris bought that property about 20 years ago, and he hopes to turn it into uh, housing for people that will be involved in what he hopes to be a big LNG Mm. plant or shipping, very much the way that Kitimat is doing right now. And he's putting his money where his mouth is because he's he's spending about a million dollars a year um, keeping the houses in good shape, keeping the buildings in good shape, and about 600,000 a year providing electricity to the place mm-hmm. so that nothing shuts down or breaks down or gets so cold that the pipes break. So it, what's fascinating about it is Chris will say that is not a ghost town. Mm-hmm. That is a property waiting to be fully realized, you know, when people return to it. But for people like you and me to look at what is going on there, mm-hmm. because Typically, when people leave buildings behind, they'll take everything with them, either to use it somewhere else or to sell it. Well, in this case, they were two hours from the nearest transport, and the mining company owned it. So nobody removed anything. So Hmm. if you go into the RBC branch in Kitzel, you will see the sign up on the wall saying, their last day of business is this. There are calendars on the wall. All the desk sets are in place. People's diaries, their old computers, everything is there. There are restaurants that are completely outfitted. Mm-hmm. Town and country restaurant has not had a outlet in Toronto in 35 years. But there's a perfectly preserved town and country restaurant with Spanish provincial furniture and all the Mm -hmm. things that your parents would have hoped to see in a restaurant that they would go to. So I thought it was quite fascinating that not only is it being kept alive, but it's being kept alive as a 1980 time capsule. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The spookiest year, frankly. (laughs) So. What, what I really like, too, is that a lot of it involves some of the houses that they had set up for people to live in. And he's kept some of the better houses mm-hmm. uh, in good shape. But you go into there, and it is 1980 furniture, a 26-inch Electrohome television. Oh, now we're talking. Cathode ray tube with the wood coffin exterior. Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. Oh, that's the stuff. That's the stuff. That's the stuff. Well, that's script that we've, yeah, no, yeah, with Kit Salt, it's interesting, right? Um, I know on one of the other, the assignments that you're working on too was uh, around a place called Cerro Gordo in uh, California. 
And that was another gentleman that spent, what was it, Peter, like $1.4 million, something like that, to buy this old mining town? Yeah, I've been trying to get in touch with him, and I, I hope to include it in the interview, in mm. this particular article. But yeah, not only, he tried to run it as a tourist town, and then he realized that somehow it was not working. The only way that he could bring people in is by actually living there. And mm -hmm. so he spent a long time living in Cerro Gordo. In fact, written a book about it, and then recorded his podcast 600 feet underground in the mine mm. of Cerro Gordo. So. <laughs> and, and like there's a running theme. Like I remember well, when we were discussing the idea of what would this year's ghost story be about. And I started to think about ghost towns. And, mm -hmm. and one of the things that was driving the idea from my end, and we tried to localize it by finding stories like Kid Salt and Cerro Gordo for us here in North America, is um, <laughs> they're fascinating. It's the Chinese fully built ghost yeah. towns yeah, yeah, that yeah. exist in China. Mm -hmm. Like you start to dive in into how much was built and how detailed and how like it's ready to go. They yeah. literally have guys like yeah. Last fit. last yeah. they were saying last uh, experts were saying that there's about 50 different municipalities, 50 different type cities like that mm -hmm. that get built out in China. You know, there's uh, one uh, Kangbashi district um, in the city of Ordos. It's like on the edge of the Gobi Desert. Mm -hmm. um, it's like a 90,000 acre district, you know what I mean? With skyscrapers, with like close to 1 million homes, places for 1 mm. million people to live and less than 100,000 live there. That's nice. You know, it looks like this, these great dystopian landscapes. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? When you look at these photos of these Chinese cities like that, there's another one called Tian Du Cheng. And that's actually got a replica of the Eiffel Tower in the center of it. You've probably seen this. Mm -hmm. and our, re our listeners can look it up on the uh, uh, on the web. So you got this replica of the Eiffel Tower that's inspired with Greek art, uh, French architecture, the homes, and there's really nobody there. But there's also not really a lot of panic either. Mm -hmm. So it's amazing to think of all that construction activity and desire to build something like that, and it sits empty. Mm -hmm. You well, know, and once again, some of the driving forces, and when I think about kit salts, and you do any other research around ghost towns, and the story's the same in whether in the Canada or the U.S. is, mm -hmm. it's usually around resources, mines, gold mines, silver mines, the rail coming in and coming out of town. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of remnants of our past built around this. I guess is what mm -hmm. I'm looking at when I think about this. Hey, eh? yeah, uh, I was watching a, a documentary about a town in Pennsylvania that is actually a ghost town, and that is mm -hmm. Centralia, Pennsylvania. And that place had a mine fire, coal mine fire that started in 1962. The documentary shows the town being, you know, quite lively prior to that, but. Now it is unsafe because the ground underneath it, all of the coal uh, has burned out, so the ground is no longer stable. So I believe it has, it used to have about a thousand people by 1980, but I believe it has about five now. And wow. basically there are just holes in the ground where smoke is pouring out and People saying, well, what are the odds that my house is going to be the one that's going to collapse into burning rubble in the ground? So, you know, I'm just going to wait this thing out. But there's no chance of ever putting it out. This is it. It's going to have to burn until it's done. Funny, I saw a similar documentary because I think I saw that one. It went on uh, Hashima Island in Japan. You may, it's called Battleship Island uh, mm -hmm. as well, right? big mining islands, you know what I mean? People stacked one on top of the other, living on it, everybody working in those mines. But once that you know, resource got depleted, slowly people just started to leave, little bit at a time. So the neat thing I uh, was that doc I had watched was somebody returning back, seeing somebody visit what was their town, and that was a ghost town in modern times is kind of interesting, mm -hmm. you know, to yeah. see them pointing out, hey, we used to play here, we used to play soccer here, my dad used to do this here. And uh, but it's all these massive built communities and cities, mm -hmm. right? That just we, it's, I guess, what is it? Uh, an example of our disposable society, maybe a bit, right? And it, we build, we use, we leave. And right? there's nothing supernatural about it, but it's still creepy as hell, anyway. Right. <laughs> You know, no, it totally is. And uh, like, there's always good ghost stories, you know what I mean? Around mm -hmm. some of these towns and stuff like that, they'll, they'll tell you about stuff. But um, maybe that's the scariest part about it is the amount mm -hmm. of money 
and yeah. resources to get put in to getting put into something they to build it and it never gets mm-hmm. used yeah right you know and that's the fascinating part like when i was doing that chinese research uh one of the stats that came up was between 2011 and 2013 china used more concrete than the u.s did in the 20th century good in their Great. construction wow and and they don't seem panicked by the fact that they have these empty cities because they bring up other examples, like yeah. local experts that and, and think tanks that have looked at them. Mm. Um, kind of saying it's like, well, they look at Shenzhen as one of these examples of a city that, like in 1980, had 12,000 people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, 30,000 people, and now it has 12 million people. Right, yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> you know, like they, they, they build and they figure eventually they will get filled in. Mm-hmm. You know? And yeah, they're I probably just, right. <laughs> you know, and meanwhile, here we struggle. In mm-hmm. North America, to build any type of affordable housing for anybody, yeah, yeah <laughs> right, exactly. You know, so fascinating stuff that way. It's interesting. Just um, two cities that are close to where we are, uh, Detroit and Buffalo, have mm-hmm. been able to manage their population collapses. Buffalo probably better than Detroit, but if you go through Detroit now. There are a lot of areas where the suburbs are now parkland because mm-hmm. there's just no reason to support um, that area. And I, I interviewed somebody once, uh, not for for DCN, but uh, another infrastructure publication. He was responsible in Detroit for cutting off water supplies to houses prior to demolition. And he said it was... They were falling so far behind just because they could not cut off the water fast enough to demolish the houses on schedule that were now being abandoned. So mm-hmm. on the other hand, uh, Buffalo sort of managed a more gentle decline. I mean, they, they probably half the population that they had in 1950. But what I thought was fascinating about them, they have a water system and the water system it was experiencing a large number of breaks when I was talking to them. And the reason surprised me, it was not because it was aging, but because too few people were using the water oh, wow. in certain areas now. Hmm. And they had to put pressure reducers on them because the pressure was now so great, it was blowing out the pipes. Oh, geez. <laughs> so. Well, but Buffalo did another thing really well, having, you know, we've grown up near it, being here in Ontario and in Toronto, mm-hmm. Peter and I. Um, it's like, it's positioned itself really well as this example of really neat art deco architecture. Mm-hmm. They have, because they're built of a time, right? They you know, like the city has these gorgeous buildings, <laughs> you know, that are great examples of art deco, art deco architecture from the 50s and 60s. You know, and they've managed to kind of encapsulate that and make it part of their tourism attraction. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And it's a small thing, but it's something that kind of gives the city that credibility, the soft landing. They've been able to position themselves in a couple of different ways, you know, and uh, once well, again. Their, their big ghost building is one of the train stations that they thought was going to service a lot of people on the edge of town. And it ended up that the traffic patterns went dif- differently. <laughs> but I did go out to that station and take a look the police kind of like what are you doing here (laughs) why are you looking at this but uh (laughs) but nonetheless it's just sitting out there in this gigantic field with a few houses around it and completely abandoned it's got a nice big tower but inside it's as you say beautiful art deco building i hope that they'll be able to make something interesting out of it and I'm a member of some brutalism architecture groups, but brutalist architecture. And because it was of a time, especially with the Eastern Soviet bloc and mm-hmm. that era there, that you have a lot of abandoned facilities and towns now that are these amazing, if you like, I'm going to say it amazing because I'll appreciate it enough. Some people think brutalism is awful as far as, mm-hmm. an, as an architecture of design. I think it, it's impressive in its own right when it's done right and uh once again ghost town university ghost town satellite installations nuclear Mm -hmm. you know what i mean shelter places and they they just stand there you know what i mean as these testaments to you know what i mean of the time encapsulating that moment in time you know what i mean for us even in um, canada there's the defen bunkers which a lot of which are like walled up now but then the the original one or like the the main one i guess is still around as a tourist attraction but that's another thing that was of its time like they were all over the place in canada Mm-hmm. at one yeah. time and then they then they were just kind of felt in 
And I wrote an article for DCN a while back about that uh, emergency services uh, building that's underground below this residential home north mm -hmm. of the city. And basically, it's got um, maps, casualty counters, um, bedrooms, and all these other things that uh, Toronto would have taken its what was left of its city council <laughs> after a nuclear attack run up there to the top of the hill in Richmond Hill and then um, and then sit in this underground bunker and and take charge of what happened so. yeah that's the thing like I use that word dystopian again it makes me think of Blade Runner you know mm -hmm. what I mean with yeah. the visuals that we see in that but um what was it the world without us that's the book that I'm looking mm, for that's the right. title yes, it's a yes, book yes. that I read oh, maybe 15 years ago it's a little, yeah it's a yeah, while at back, least yeah. right yeah well back and uh, and I remember that book you know what I mean how the earth would reclaim uh, you know what I mean what, mm -hmm. the land that we've taken from it that we've changed yeah. that we've remanufactured re-engineered from it that you know what I mean? it doesn't matter what we build and how it's built you know what I mean sooner or later earth will take it back in its own way if even we were, you know Go Even ahead, with the ahead. pandemic, uh, and I was getting pandemic flashbacks listening to this stuff yeah. about that well-preserved town, because when we would go in to get our, our computer monitors and furniture and stuff a year or two into the pandemic, it felt the same. You're walking in and everything is the date, everything closed down. So it's not quite the distance in time, but I know the feeling. But mm -hmm. the, during the pandemic, it's like two or three years that that was uh, in lockdown, even then animals were coming back into town. They 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 they, could, they knew something was up, and they were trying to repopulate basically. <laughs> no, I mean I I walk in Midtown Toronto, and 11 p.m. I'm walking with my dog on one side of the road, and on the other side, a couple of coyotes are padding along, <laughs> to sort of give, us, give us a quick sniff, and they're about their business. But yeah, that never changed after the pandemic either mm -hmm. same here in vancouver i've run into coyotes a couple times on the seawall which is a pretty well trafficked area of downtown so mm -hmm. well that's cool well i mean uh, we'll have a halloween story the or stories depending how it all works out with interviews mm -hmm. um obviously i leave peter to craft these wonderful pieces that he's provided mm -hmm. for us as our longtime writer. And uh, I always look forward to them. So our readers can look for that. Our discussion's not over yet, though, nope, as we no talk about not. like haunted structures and it's kind of fitting because today's national horror film day. I did not you know, that. know that. I did not I had know. No idea. This. So I've been saving this tidbit to throw it on you guys here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, Consider talking, it like who the better, who's the better crowd for me to drop this on. Apparently oh, yeah. this was just created last year as a holiday. Well, it's to honor enough. Say, say, <laughs> Sam Raimi because it's his oh, birthday. Nice. Uh, nice. It's the date of his birth. That makes sense. Uh, and for our listeners, there's no two better people for me to pass the mic to, to describe oh, yeah. the importance of Sam Raimi before we get into talking about movies. So I mean, gentlemen, could, go ahead. I could rant or rave or do you want to do a bit, Peter? <laughs> I, I just want to tell you that before Sam Raimi was any name in mm -hmm. anything, mm -hmm. I was going to Ryerson and the evil dead was showing at a theater that's long since been demolished and it had a little bit of buzz around it. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, what the heck? I'll just check that out. <laughs> I went to see it, and I was actually scared watching this film for the first time because it was presenting horrible stuff in a way that I had never seen before. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when it's opening those synapses, it can mm -hmm. scare you. And I remember yeah. there were three people in the theater with me. And even though I was watching it in the afternoon, I was still uncomfortable. And <laughs> at a certain point, I flinched, and I actually, I'm ashamed to say, covered my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> now, the second one, I was the first Sam Raimi thing I, thing I ever saw on VHS, probably in, I think it came out in 87, so probably 88, 89. Uh, and I just remember thinking to myself as an 18-year-old, you could do this with movies? Holy crap! Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I just watched it about a year ago. Uh, again and it still goes like it's still completely legit like it's the first five minutes it's insanity wall to wall for the next hour and a half like it's just there's okay here's this tape and now here's the demons and then go crazy <laughs> like mm -hmm. and it still holds up like what is that 40 years later almost i think right no it is uh, i always say my um i always say when asked when we get talking about with people mm -hmm. um the foundation i think for what i love in horror starts with the r and r's romero and Remy. Oh yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. Especially as an immigrant kid, like being learning the language, like the language actually didn't matter. Mm -hmm. 
with some of that. No, it's stuff. all visuals. It's all visuals. All the visuals, and they terrified yeah. the heck out of me. Yeah. As a kid, right? Like Peter was saying, like for me, it was like I'd never seen stuff presented that way, mm-hmm. and it worked. So then the magic coming in once I, you know, I mean, you learn how to speak English and, and mm-hmm. listen to it all. But uh, those two are the foundation for yeah, like yeah. all these awesome movies now that we get to enjoy, that we enjoy. My wife looks at me and goes, how do you like this stuff? <laughs> you know, the, great, there's like, the, you know what I mean? Whatever, the 12 Days of Christmas. I'm like the 12 Days of Horror film oh, yeah, leading yeah, up to, to, to Halloween. <laughs> enough, I mean, this whole idea of being stuck as you are in Night of the Living Dead and Dawn mm. of the Dead. Yeah, and, and Dawn, the, the better Dead, one of the two. In the farmhouse and, yeah. and Dawn mm. of the Dead stuck in a shopping center. But mm. in both cases, as a friend of mine and I have discussed that, that we're barely willing to admit it, but of course I'll now admit it on this podcast, there's a coziness to it. Oh yeah, totally. That is undeniable, even though there is unrelenting horror out there. Kind of like, I wish I was there, you know, because mm-hmm. it seems really kind of cozy to be in that. And Don in particular plays with that because it kind of takes yeah. them by surprise. It's like the third act is, oh, no, we've been gotten too comfortable, right? So, Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a thing as I, with my sons, especially the oldest, as he starts to see more on social media. It's like you'll hear this kid just say to you, he's like, no, Dad, I'd love to see a tornado, but not see anybody get hurt. <laughs> you know what I mean? I want to get close yeah. enough. Another. I'd love to be experienced in an earthquake and make sure nobody gets hurt. Yeah. It's that fascination with the thing mm-hmm. that we can't control and that provide the that can instill fear and that yeah, adrenaline yeah. rush, right? Yeah. You know, my wife, when we talk about Dawn of the Dead, uh, um, th- like we've talked about between the three of us, you know what I mean? Uh, the, the Walking Dead, mm-hmm. uh, introducing her to that. Uh, I've been into it before. For some folks, it is the survivalist nature of it all. They may not mm-hmm. care about, you know what I mean? How do you make this scary? How does this work? How does the makeup work? How does the dialogue work? Mm-hmm. It's more like, well, how are they going to survive that? Yeah. That's you know what it. I mean? And that's kind of the success, I think, of some of these films, right? Mm-hmm. It's like it taps into people that would never traditionally like a horror or suspense movie, but it triggers something in them, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. For mm-hmm. me, uh, even the success of The Walking Dead, when it was successful, and I swear it was good. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I think that they, undervalued scenes where they were just getting their stuff together and doing mm-hmm. things to build fortifications and all of that thing. I liked watching that. I could watch endlessly people foraging and going through whole buildings and, and getting cars working. That to mm-hmm. me is fascinating. And then they felt, I think, that they maybe didn't have confidence in that material. Mm-hmm. So they put some ridiculous shock Ooh. into the middle of it when i was really enjoying it so. <laughs> mm-hmm. exactly yeah no it's the truth uh, that's a show uh, peter you and i talked about you actually once surprised me you know what i mean with the story from the walking dead the walking dead you talked to one of the set was it the set construction designer that's mm-hmm. right i vince made me a bet that i could not get the walking dead reasonably into daily commercial news <laughs> so I'll really you where we can run a photo from the mm. walking dead on the front cover and it'll be good enough that it will deserve it. So, yeah. <laughs> and he came through with fine colors, nice. but he, he nice. you preempt, you, you, you made sure I was by my computer and you <laughs> filed it, you know what I mean? So I could see it. And I remember whooping and going, yeah, this is amazing. <laughs> you know? And, uh, I don't know, but that show did fall off the cliff after a while. So, yeah. you know, talk about like the, the perils of not really, you know what I mean? Staying on top of your success, you know, and taking stuff for granted, you know, but I think about scenarios in that we saw on that show, like the town, like Alexandria, which proves mm-hmm. to be important. I still remember some construction sequences in there when they're working on fortifications or when the town expanded, but it's like fascinating to see how they would have built that. Take the mm-hmm. time because I think that's probably the underappreciated thing that like, you probably could have collected even more fans. Because yeah. they would have been fascinated, just the basic survivalist types. Mm-hmm. You know, we saw how survivalist types are with this recent pandemic. Yeah, the people that would have claimed to be prepared <laughs> but, turned out to be yeah. the snowflakes. Exactly. You know what yeah. I mean? Crying yeah. and complaining. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? And, and other people were battle hardened and ready to go, mm-hmm. right? Or find the challenge. And other right? people you'd and, think it'd be either. So yeah. Yeah, you know, always thought that. So. Anyway, so yeah, so today's National Horror Film Day. Folks, yes, new, and newly minted, apparently. It only got announced that, last year. So in honor of that, I'd like to hear your you recommendations. With this. Either, you go yeah, ahead, Peter, go, Peter, go, Peter, you go oh, ahead. Peter, go. Well, I would say that recently, 
I've been starting to watch Argentinian horror movies because uh -huh. they have a certain energy that I think is kind of lacking somewhat in the mm -hmm. um, in mm -hmm. in the North American product. And two films that I watched that I really enjoyed, Terrified was one of the first about a house that has paranormal activity in it. And it actually surprised and somewhat startled me. So mm -hmm. Terrified is a good one. And another one called A History of the Occult, also Argentinian movie. It's on Tubi TV for free mm. right now. Tubi is the, but, the hidden gem of horror. You can find yes. tons of stuff on there. Yes. That's right. And it is a story that I think it's unique. I, I can only say that it, it, it uh, just to set it up, it's about a an investigative TV program in the 1980s that is trying to prove that all of Argentina and all of its government is being led by a corporation that is involved in demon worship and uh, witchcraft and that they've been using these powers to make sure that they stay in power forever. Um, nobody can assail the presidential election or, or win it because if you show yourself to be successful, you will disappear. Ah. <laughs> they want Precious. to prove that, in fact, that they can completely eliminate people to the point that nobody remembers who they were. And Whoa. so that is another one. Um, Which has I some uh, real world implications with Argentina of the past, too, right? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and that is certainly not, uh, not lost on people. No, that yeah, yeah. Yeah, so those so, are two that I would recommend. So go for it, Vince. No, it's funny you mentioned Argentinian. Right now I'm, I'm pausing because I'm trying to remember the name. This is at least 10 years ago. But what you're talking about the energy in the Argentinian mm -hmm. films, Peter. I remember there were two Spanish oh, Is this Wreck? Is this the, is this the uh, I'm trying Friday to remember films? what they were called. They yeah. were just fabulous. Like, I'm well, going to say no. just fabulous. They Warren were entertaining. Made... Was it Wreck? Rec, there's a series of ones called Rec as an yeah. REC recording, and it's like a news crew that are caught in essentially a zombie outbreak. Uh, and right. I think the first one is fantastic. Yes. So I think I think the that's what you're talking is, about. Yes, yeah. yeah. And I remember that being surprised. I was like, oh my god, my world beyond Japanese horror, you know what mm -hmm. I mean, and stuff like that, and traditional North American stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like there's other great stuff out there, and I'm trying to remember those titles. I'll see if I can, so we can have them in our. We should put all these films in our. Oh yeah, yeah Show sure. notes as well mm -hmm. when we get to that. But um, uh, for me, it, they're traditional, and I know they're mainstream to a degree, but not to a degree they are. But for me, my all-time still favorite, as always, the recommend is Exorcist. Right? Of course, of course. I've run into enough people still that haven't seen it from my generation. That's you know what I mean? Because they, they, they yeah. were scared enough. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, at this point, if you're over 40, you should watch it. Yeah. <laughs> right? If you haven't, right? Well, the um, first time I saw The Exorcist, I was in the hospital. That's a I bad had one of those little televisions. Setup that you yeah. could have on a big arm mm -hmm. and it was sort of sitting in front of my face and the first time linda blair spins her head around and shows her horrific face i remember going oh and i couldn't <laughs> get it slammed into the wall mm. uh, now it's interesting the reason that william peter blatty wrote that original story because people have asked why did you write something so horrible and soul destroying and and he said essentially this he said people have spent all their lives trying to convince people of the existence and presence of god in their lives mm -hmm. and he says with varying success but he says i felt that if i created a portrait of pure unmitigated satanic evil that by doing that, people would also have to accept that the opposite exists, that mm -hmm. God is there as well. Hmm. And so that was his intention in, in, in putting that whole book together to begin with. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. I've never heard that. Yeah. That is awesome. Oh, well, it worked, yeah. I bet you. Yeah, it totally yeah. did. And it became a huge <laughs> A lot of people were clutching their crucifixes during that. Mm. Well, I was just going to say, the memory uh, I have is with, yeah. yeah, as a child is my nonna, my Italian grandmother with her rosary, her black beaded rosary, mm. yeah, yeah. sitting there on the couch as we're watching this thing, yeah. and she's ripping through that thing, giving herself blisters, right? Because she's like, what is this? But I also see where my fascination with horror and stuff like that, my mm. family has been yeah. like that 
everyone just loving that type of stuff to get spooked, right? Yeah. So uh, you were saying about the Catholic Church war? Well, what, they, they actually recommended the film. They were they didn't come out against it. They were for it because they said this is an accurate depiction of what this is like, whether you yeah. could take that to the bank or not, whatever. But but that's what the Catholic Church said. There wasn't a backlash to it at the time. Mm. There was, but not from the Catholic Church, From unless I'm getting my facts way off, which is possible. But I think you're right, though, Warren. Because I just because I remember the Catholic Church got really mad at Life of Brian. Okay. <laughs> and, yeah. But, and then people called back to that and said, "Oh, but this happened with the Exorcist, right? The exact opposite." Um, right. My anti recommendation is I haven't <laughs> finished it. It's on it's on my queue on Shutter, which is Late Night with the Devil, which is a great idea. It's an exorcism live on the air on this essentially Johnny Carson esque show from the seventies that doesn't exist, but it's shot from the perspective of more or less the studio cameras, and then you get 16 mil stuff in the background where they're talking, right? Because there's, for some reason, a documentary crew there, like all found footage things. Um, my anti-recommendation is, A, it didn't really grab me that much, but B, and this is very much a specific annoyance of mine, is that all the studio camera stuff is obviously HD footage that they've kind of screwed around with and made it look like, like, so just get the studio cameras, guys. You want this to be genuine, get the studio cameras. Otherwise, it doesn't work. But I understand why they had to add effects and all the rest of it. You can't really do that with, with, but it just, the video nerd part of me couldn't look past the fact that that's clearly HD footage and not proper SD garbage from the 70s like you're supposed to portray. Right. Well, I lived through the 70s, and that, this is, uh, it may be unfair, but mm -hmm. there were times where I will watch something, and there will be one historic detail or one use of a, of a piece of language mm -hmm. that will just reach out and hit me in the oh, face. Yeah. And at that, that point, too. I'm like, all right, I'm done with this. Yeah. I'm done yeah. with this movie. This doesn't make it. You throw me out of it. And I think yeah. that one case was uh, I was watching a movie and it was a, I'm trying to remember the name of it, but it was a modern take on Macbeth set in Pennsylvania and involving two competing burger chains. <laughs> okay. Christopher Walken is in it. I'm trying to remember the name of it, but at one point they were trying to identify this character that might have witnessed a murder and set in 1971 and they're saying, oh, you must mean that homeless person down by the track. <laughs> yeah, and nobody I'm would going, say that. Oh, bum. <laughs> that's what I, they would have said. They I said experienced that's this. bum living down by the tracks, right? I experienced yeah. this with Stranger Things, where um, the, the two kids, season three or four, whichever season where the Russians are hiding in plain sight, and the kids are down there, and it turns out the girl is is, uh, is a lesbian, and the, the boy is very, very supportive. That's all great. Uh, I'm happy for them, but... I lived through the 80s. That would not have happened. Like, to mm -hmm. our shame, that would have mm -hmm. never happened. So I just I remember pointing that out going, uh, I don't know if they would have been that tolerant in Iowa or wherever this is in 1985. <laughs> like, that doesn't that doesn't ring true for anybody who's lived through the 80s. That's unfortunate, and it's bad, and it's wrong. Don't get me wrong. But that's not the way it was in, the hist in his no, history. No, exactly. Right? So if you've lived through it, you're like, oh, this is just a facsimile of the 80s, which, of course, it is. It's a TV show. But I mean... Yeah. Well, I mean, with films like I, I went off with The Exorcist, like my other go to is now we talked about well, we were just talking about favorite slasher films and this and that. The difference do you like slasher versus horror? Like, mm -hmm. I've never been much of a why not a both? saw, yeah, why <laughs> not both? But like the saw series never really interested me. That mm -hmm. type of genre never did as far as horror. I'm dedicated to Halloween. Michael Myers mm -hmm. is my favorite guy. Yeah, yeah that's you know the best what I mean. One. As far yeah, as the, yeah. yeah, it's the best one, and it's not gory, it's very, yeah. uh, very much ungory. That's what's good about it. There's well, a pacing what? to the film, yeah. right? In the first one, you know what I mean? Yeah, the, the every, I'm talking to guys that know way more than me. Like the pacing, the sound, mm. you feel it. You know, even now, the music makes the, the movie. Music, yeah, it still works oh. all these years later, having seen it multiple times. And it's always mm -hmm. a must watch on Halloween night after trick or treat. Oh, yeah. There is house, that anyways. moment for me, though, for films that I don't enjoy torture. No, I don't mm, want no. people being tortured. I don't mm. mind seeing them injured. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But I don't you know, want to see anything prolonged. And for other me, than Bruce Campbell, if Bruce Campbell's being tortured, it's okay. <laughs> but he's laughing while he's while it's happening. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but for me, there comes a moment where I'm watching a movie, and then I'm thinking, okay, I'm viewing this movie and enjoying it, and then when it reaches a certain level of violence, I feel I'm participating in the movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, you're right. There's, there's that threshold. And once I cross that threshold, off it goes. I mm -hmm. I will completely turn it off. At that yeah, point. I'm in the same boat. Like you got to you got to be exploited, exploitative for a reason. 
Yes. And it's funny how your synapses and everything triggers and what you remember, I find. Mm -hmm. uh, the last time I went to a theater that... No, the last time <laughs> I watched a movie at a theater that kind of left me with a bit of... I probably talked about this in other Halloween pods we've done together. That left me a little scared or suspenseful. And it wasn't at the time. Was, uh, it was the first movie, uh, the English version of The Ring. The first oh, right. Movie. Yes, yes, yes. Watched it. Enjoyed it. You know, I mean, at the theater, I can't say I like. I felt a lot of apprehension during it, or why not? It was kind of cool to see the girl. If you haven't watched it, I'm not ruining anything. When but when she climbs, she starts to walk out of the television towards one of the protagonists in the film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah great imagery. I thought, oh, wow, that looks cool. I wonder how they did it. You know, and I remember that night dropping the guys, the guys that I was with, home. Each of them. So I had three stops to make on the way home. I'm <laughs> driving, and Peter, you you know the road, Haven Road in North York. Uh, because Peter Kenter and I, strangely enough, you know what I mean, kind of grew up, not mm -hmm. grew up, we, we were from the same neighborhood, you mm -hmm. could say, mm -hmm. or we lived in the same neighborhood, not from. And uh, I'm making a right onto Haven, and I look at my rearview mirror, and I swear, the trick of the mind, right? I saw that girl with the long, straggly hair <laughs> sitting in my backseat of my rearview mirror, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I actually, it actually startled me, yeah. <laughs> you know? And I'm like, that movie worked. You yeah. know what I mean? Like yeah. I haven't watched it since. I don't do. know how it's aged. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But at the time, I'm like, you, that, well done. You know what I mean? You left a bit of a, a scare in me somewhere, mm -hmm. subconsciously, right? But... All right. Uh, well, I think we've pretty much covered everything, as per usual, and maybe a bit more, uh, as we do in the, on our Halloween specials. So I would like to thank you, uh, Peter, and you, Vince, for joining me again this year. Thank you so much, guys. That was a lot of fun. Always fun. <laughs>